Okay, you want to take control of the screen. Okay. Um, I don't really have a, a, a PowerPoint or anything to show you. I wasn't sure exactly what format we were going to be doing, so um, I just thought I would just share some of my experiences. Um, so hello, everyone. Um, and I, I, this term, I have a particular challenge, which I thought would be uh, useful to share, uh, because I have the delight of being able to run one of um, our large classes in, in classics. So I have Greek civilization this term. And this means that this is a course which which is uh, got 340 students registered in it. And what's really interesting is because it's a context credit, I have students from all over uh, the, the university and many different faculties and departments. And so this really gives me uh, a slice of the whole university in a way to, uh, to be dealing with. Uh, so this has been an interesting challenge and thinking about this course, how I would normally do it, of course, in lecture with lots of seminars. Um, so this term, I've, of course, like everyone, was struggling to figure out what to do. But for my lectures, I decided, and for the course in general, I decided I was going to do uh, asynchronous because I kind of felt like that was going to be the easiest way for both me and the students to deal with all of this, right? And so I did my lectures the way I would always do them um, with PowerPoint. And I have lots of text, but also lots of images in my um, in my in my, in my in my lectures. And so these are um, lectures which are I kind of consider myself to be a bit of a storyteller. And so these are uh, lectures which now I have taken and and voiced. And so I just kind of wrote what I would normally say on those. And so that's actually been a challenge, but but actually worked quite well for me. And so those I then turn into MP4s and then put up on Echo 360. And I, those of you who are working with Echo 360 in the beginning of this term will know that we had some challenges with that. Um, I had lots of students writing me in the first week or two. Ah, I can't get them. I can't see them. Right. Um, but we eventually worked those out. It usually turned out to be a browser uh, issue with cookies. Um, so after the first three weeks, uh, I have to say that I it was hairy because I have never had more emails in my life in a class than this term. Um, and the reason for this is because even though I had I thought I had been clear about my instructions, I had written them out, I had put them on Sakai. Uh, what I hadn't done, which I wish I had done now, was make some uh, short in introductory videos around just how to do things. Uh, instructional videos and I kind of hadn't really really sort of thought that that might be really relevant or helpful and I think because I had a really high intake of first year students in the first term uh, who were not you know uh, up to snuff on Brock systems, don't know anything about Sakai, right? Even figuring out how to use email, really, in some cases. Um, so I think that was a challenge, which I would really have, looking back now, think I would have probably done a little bit more along those lines. Um, although I did uh, reach out to the students and ask them a number of polls um, about communication, and, and they're all happy with it now. So I do weekly communications with my students. Uh, I have announcements coming out. I always do announcements at the beginning of my lectures. And also, I am running uh, Teams office hours. And so with all of that, it's turned out to be fine now. Uh, everything's running smoothly, but I certainly uh, wouldn't have expected as many hiccups. And I guess those are the reality of when you're in a lecture, you are talking to the students at the beginning of class and giving them all that information. That's missing. And so you kind of really have to replace that. Um, so for the rest of my course, um, the lectures are going fine. Um, so the seminars, of course, the other thing that's the real problem. How do we how do we replace seminars? And this is the other uh, sort of struggle I've had. And I think it's gone pretty well. But what I've done is I've replaced my seminars with uh, worksheets for which would ask some questions about lecture material and readings I've given them. And then I have forums. And so the forums are uh, both the week worksheets and the forums are due weekly. I have nine of them over the course of the, the term, uh, which I've reduced from one, one from 10 I usually do. So I try to give them a little bit of breaks here and there so that they're not so overwhelmed this term. Um, and all of this, I think, has worked pretty well. So I found the forums, now that they're getting the hang of them, they're actually working really well. Um, so I wouldn't uh, hesitate to recommend forums. 
as a way to um, have the students interact with each other. Now, obviously, it's not the same as a seminar, but I'm, I am finding that they are making those, uh, those efforts to come into the forums to post, but then also to reply. And so I've told them to do both, both post and reply. Uh, so I have a 300 word um, amount for the week, and I ask them to divide that into two different posts. And so they're generally doing that. So that's kind of nice to see. And now that they're now that we're you know halfway through the term, uh, things are coming along. Um, I did some polls in my class, and this is what I really did want to share with you because these are um, kind of questions which maybe uh, some of you might have about how how to organize or structure your courses. And I asked them a series of questions about uh, synchronous and asynchronous and things like this. And so I just want to share some of the have from you um, with you. Uh, so around course preference, like do they prefer their uh, courses? Uh, in general to be synchronous or asynchronous. I had 81% said asynchronous. So that's, I thought, kind of interesting that they really do prefer to, I think, work on their own time and own schedule. Um, bearing in mind also that in my class, I probably have a percentage, I don't know how high, I didn't ask this, but of people who aren't actually maybe even in Canada. I know of a few students who are in India, for instance. So, so that asynchronous can really be helpful there. Um, preference for lectures between synchronous and asynchronous, again, 81% said asynchronous lectures, that they preferred that. Uh, for seminars, 73% uh, said they preferred asynchronous seminars. So that would be using things like the forums versus um, teams, I guess, for a live seminar. Um, and the last two questions um, I asked them was uh, for whether they would prefer an idea of a blended seminar. Um, and this was, I don't know, I've been trying to think about, is there a way to blend seminars? So could I do split my, my marks in half, do half uh, one question in the forum, let's say, and then one half hour meeting on Teams? Now, they weren't entirely sure what that meant, but 51% said no and 30% said maybe. So most of them seem not to be keen on that kind of an idea. So I haven't tried it, so I don't know if it's how doable it was or if it would just be more complicated than it would be worth. So um, but I just thought it was interesting that they didn't think or they weren't sure that that would really be a great idea. And finally, the workload, I asked them about workload in, in my, both my class and then also across the board. In my class, they were pretty happy with it. 83% it was re said it was reasonable, so I kind of feel like I haven't really overwhelmed them with too much work. Um, but more worrisome, the workload across the board in all their courses, when I asked them about this, 58% um, said they were good to okay, um, so I'm blumping those two categories together. And 42% said they were not good or, you know, having terrible time trying to keep themselves organized. So 42 to 58 kind of shows you that there's a big split in how they're perceiving their workloads this year. So I kind of wanted to share that to give you that idea that um, I've reduced my workload a little bit in my class. And I think that I'm happy that I did that. Um, so I think this is something that we need to be thinking about. So, so those are my my thoughts. So I'd be happy to ask, answer any questions later if, if people have them. That's great. Thank you, Nadine. I, there's some comments in the chat, which I really agree with too. It's just um, important to get that feedback, really helpful mm -hmm. to know where the students are at because we were, you know, a lot of it were based on assumptions. There is literature on it, but it's also what are our actual students in our particular discipline thinking. Um, so I think we will, uh, unless there's like a pressing question, well, maybe we'll just bring it back for a larger discussion and then I will, um, we'll go on to the next um, uh, presenters, Nick and Dylan. So to, uh, to, to briefly introduce both of them, they're actually staff members who, Nick is part of our extended team, I consider, because he um, works in the Faculty of Education. Um, and Dylan, I believe, is part of the makerspace, but um, both of them are also instructors in the interactive arts and science and their co-teaching, which is such a great practice. Uh, Leanne and I have done that numerous years and it's a really great practice. So I'm really happy that they um, volunteered to come and share what they were doing, which is really interesting. So if I can pass it to Nick and Dylan. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I, as Julia mentioned, Dylan and I are co-instructing the level design and in, in immersive and immersive media uh, course with interactive arts and science. Um, we're here to talk today about one, how we're doing a sort of forum discussion or discussion and assignment submission through a tool called Discord, uh, which is sort of a gaming communication platform, uh, as well as some of our experimentation with H5P in, li in align with creating content modules. So I'm going to pass it along to Dylan to start us off. 
Sounds like a brilliant plan. I'm just going to quickly pull up a presentation here just to quickly give some quick visual examples of what I'm going to be talking about. So the first portion here, I'm going to go over and quickly cover the tool of Discord, why we picked it, what benefits we found from it, um, and what we've really been uh, benefiting from. So skip that forward one. Uh, so ooh, welcome to Discord. Uh, Discord is, as Nick pointed out, an online uh, communication tool that has a variety of very, very robust features that we were already familiar with because it is a gaming platform. Nick and I uh, game together. So this was a tool we were already very familiar with. But what was more important was that this is a tool that the students were already familiar with, and this is where our students already were. This wasn't a tool that was going to be new to them, and they were already going to have a lot of uh, a lot of familiarity with the system uh, to the point that we're very happy that Discord is as robust a platform as it is because it means we can do uh, assert a lot of control over what the students can and cannot see at any point in time. Um, as a general example of this, this is our welcome channel in Discord. Um, and what I mean by welcome channel is much of the way that you have uh, channels inside of teams or you can have different teams on the left side of the little uh, image here I've got you've got all these different channels you've got two voice channels and text channels voice channels you can pop into and have voice you can have video you can share a screen it's fantastic text channels are text um, but they can be embedded they can have formatting um, and the great part about each of these channels is you can give very specific role assignments. So for example, uh, you can see that this big old post here on our welcome channel is posted by me. Um, now I've renamed myself inside of this specific Discord uh, channel uh, to Instructor Dylan. And I've also given myself a special role. Nick and I both share an instructor role, which is basically we have the keys to the kingdom. It's very similar to what you find on Sakai inside of the instructor role. However, you can also make as many roles with as many controls and as many tools as you'd like. So all of the students have three roles. They are a student, they have a discussion group, and they have a uh, their own unique role. Uh, the reason that we do that is if they're a student, I can give them access to certain channels, uh, and I can give them access to certain privileges simply by being a student. So if you look on the left side again, it's out of those text channels. It's very small, but you'll notice most of the channels on the top right little corner have a little lock on all of them. You can't access those unless you have certain permissions. Nick and I as instructors can see them all. A student in our course only sees the welcome channel, the general questions, uh, the online discussion, and the uh, their own unique your instructor chat. It's individualized. Um, and just to quickly answer that question, yes, Discord is completely free. Um, there is a big flag with that that, that I was going to get to, but uh, it's not supported by Brock. So there is no support coming uh, officially from Brock. This is a tool that uh, uh, Nick and I were already very familiar with, so we're very comfortable using it. And we knew the students are as well. And knowing that we have all these robust controls, there's a couple other perks that are very, very beneficial to us. The first big one that we like to really uh, sink into is uh, this lovely guy. So in our course, we have six online discussion groups where traditionally these would be our forms that we could use on Sakai. We've elected to use them inside of Discord. Why? Um, for a couple of reasons. One, we find it is way more similar to what is an instant messaging service. So, you know, students are already using WhatsApp, text messaging, Facebook Messenger. This is already very akin to that experience. It has uh, a lot of the same uh, formatting. You're able to at people very, very easily. It's live updated. You receive notifications. That's been a huge one for us. Uh, it, Discord is also supported on a mobile and a desktop format. So if there is a conversation occurring in their groups, if the student is just on the bus on their phone, bing, they get a notification on Discord that a conversation is happening. That creates a whole different dynamic than when a Sakai post goes up. There's a possibility that they might notice it or they know they have to check it. Um, what's been really great this year, because we've changed how we did our online uh, discussion format from last year, is we're finding the students are actually having a conversation due to this. It's less, you know, here is a post, uh, and here's my response to it. Now it's here's a topic and here's all of the conversation we're having going down. I've taken the liberty of blurring out all of our student information on this particular page, uh, but those are all different people that are having a conversation. And that is only a small excerpt of their conversation. It was something very exciting that Nick and I noticed uh, this year where we're happy if we can get them to have, you know, a response to the, the prompts because that facilitates their grades. But this was an engaged conversation that the students were having. Uh, 
another good question just popped up by Netta. The work is assessed. Um, basically, their online discussion groups are assessed from a analysis of their uh, critical thinking because what we're doing is we're giving them a prompt on the week subject matter and it's not a prompt that is uh, explicitly has a right or wrong answer because what we're trying to look for is how they explore the topic and taking their understanding that they should have gotten from our content that Nick will show off uh, at the later part of this presentation and how they can form their own opinion around it and uh, construct their own thoughts on it. They're working pretty well so far. Uh, which will pop me out to the fourth section here, just so I can make sure that it is known and available. Uh, this handy dandy little, oops, yeah, no worries. Uh, this handy dandy uh, little last section are, 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 are your instructor chats. Uh, each student has their own individualized your instructor chat, because I'm sure as many of us are familiar with as an instructor, when you ask a student to email you, um, <laughs> <laughs> at least for us, we find that very rarely has a follow through. Most of our students try to contact us in other ways if we're able to uh, be available during our tutorial hours uh, or our office hours, uh, by all means, hey, that's fantastic, we're there. Um, if they don't come to that though, we found giving them a platform that is their own uh, specific channel that just for them to ask us questions. And also, as you can see here, they're submitting their assignments via this platform as well. So it's all in one continuous space where we're able to very easily give feedback to the last assignment they provided, or we're able to keep track of where each of these assignments are before passing their grades through inside of the gradebook in Sakai. So very, very uh, robust tool. Again, always give the marker that Brock does not offer official support for this tool. This is something we're comfortable with, but the great success that we found with this tool so far is, uh, is simply the robustness of it and the fact that it has everything inside of it. And it's way more familiar to them using an instant messaging app. It's way more familiar to them using text. Everything we have uh, is completely under our control here and through the really dynamic uh, role assignment, that student, their unique ID, and what discussion group they're in, we can have a lot of control over what students can and cannot do, um, down to the fact that we can control whether they can or cannot use certain emojis uh, once you get familiar enough with Discord. Uh, happy to take any questions uh, about this at uh, uh, the end of the presentation, by all means. Um, but yeah, for now, I'm going to pass it off to Nick, who's going to show you, uh, now that this is where you know we have our students communicate and show off a lot of their work, where do they actually see our work? Off to you, Nick. <laughs> Thank you, Dylan. Thank you, Dylan. Uh, yeah, uh, for the most part, I think uh, the Discord channel worked really well for the weekly assignments that we did. We still use the assignments tool in Sakai to sort of take in larger written submissions and things like that. But for the most part, when it came to submission of media and submission of short written responses, Discord really, uh, we really enjoyed the platform in that way. So I'm going to shift gears and showcase some of the work that we've been doing here in eCampus Ontario's H5P Studio. Uh, so just as a quick opening, uh, the eCampus H5P Studio is a space to create, share, and discover interactive learning objects. Uh, the site uses H5P, which is an open source plugin that allows content authors to easily create interactive content uh, for the courses or other instructional projects. Uh, and I will put the caveat that if you're looking more into the community of H5P, their originating website is h5p.org but the eCampus H5P Studio is h5pstudio.ecampus.ca. You can see the, the HTML at the top, or if you Google the title, you should find it pretty easily. Uh, eCampus Ontario's H5P uh, Studio is available to anyone with an email address associated with one of the 45 member institutions, which would be colleges and universities in Ontario. And the goal is for accessibility content types. And the content types are really the learning objects that you can create um, to be WCGAG 2.1 or uh, and AA in that regard. Uh, so what I'm looking at here is the catalog. And I want to highlight the share aspect first before I move on because is really nice of an opportunity to create, but also to share any of the learning, learning objects um, that are created by the members of the 45 member institutions. Uh, we can see here by type that these in elements are interactive videos, they're drag and drop learning objects, the course presentations, and you can even use the, the search options on the left to sort of find ideas or to remix and reuse sometimes uh, what's been shared. So let's look to the how we've integrated it with Sakai. Uh, so predominantly, we liked the space 
uh, what we were initially looking for was a space to create engaging content um, where we can have differences or different opportunities to do interactive assessments as well as interactive content display. Um, as well as we we're looking for something with a bit of a more uh, updated UI. And we found that through H5P, we we're able to have this sort of UI for our uh, content slides. And actually, I'll backtrack a tad bit back to my create option here in H5P. What we used was the interactive book. So everything created today was used using the interactive book um, learning object, which allows you to create small courses, books, and tests as it describes, but it's really a nice place that amalgamates a lot of the different learning objects that are available, which be, which may have been more specific, such as image hotspots, you know, con uh, uploading a video, uploading of imagery, and things like that. But and at the same token, we very much specified on content display. We didn't dabble too much into the interactive assessment pieces because there's no real way to attach student accounts to this space. Um, and in that way, every time a student views my interactive book, which I'll go back to now, uh, they get a, a new view or a new version of it every time. So if they were to do a long winded a, a test of some kind, uh, going back to it will only refresh the entirety of the test. So when we do get to it, maybe we might look at doing uh, maybe self quizzes and things like that. But at the moment, we're not going too far down the assessment piece. We're simply looking at content display. So as I look at the page we have here for week one, uh, the things that we did enjoy from the service was the fact that you can navigate in, multi in, a, in a couple different ways. Um, one, you can use lefts and rights across the top here to go through the different uh, content items. And you can also use the table of contents here on the left to navigate through as well, which essentially means that students did not need to be going back and forth on different web pages. They could simply say in one continuous experience. Uh, what we also liked was the fact that uh, it zooms quite well. Uh, we found that the information looks quite large, which we like to say makes it very readable for the audience. Um, and as well, it, 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 come, it, it maintains that our images demand attention. Um, and I also want to highlight here that this is an added benefit to the expertise we had in the team was that Dylan was uh, really capable with Illustrator and was able to make custom images uh, for the presentations. Again, looking for that engaging aspect of it and, and moving away from a, a text space or heavy text space sort of course. Uh, a picture's worth a thousand words and we definitely saved more than that over the course of the course. Uh, so I'll move on from just simple text, video, and imagery to showcase some of the additional elements that H5P can use uh, when we look at doing content display. Uh, for example, and these are very basic, but you know we utilize them where we can. Uh, these are flip cards that you can use uh, within this space. Again, uh, here we use it as AAA level designers, what type of tasks they might be doing within the team, uh, within a large sort of uh, industry team. Uh, and in a smaller, more indie space, a level designer could be doing obviously much more things uh, when you look at small business versus large corporate corporations on specificity of, of job types. Um, so again, we, we use the flip cards to sort of illustrate that instead of having, again, a long winded text explanation for it. Um, even here uh, doing you know more long winded text explanation, but uh, through the idea of the flip card. And I'm sure many of you can think of ways that you can in introduce flip cards into your learning or sorry, your teaching as well. Uh, I'm going to go back to my Sakai page and highlight that this is how we were able to embed or to link to the H5P modules. Uh, there is a current issue with, inter with, link with embedding interactive book that H5P is looking into. Uh, at the moment, they still haven't had it resolved. So what we've been forced to do is simply just link directly to the module, the interactive books that we've been creating, as opposed to having it embedded within Sakai. Um, that would obviously be our, our first case or our best case scenario. Uh, the next thing I want to point you to is the Agamotto option, which is essentially a, a phase between two images or multiple images. And we use it here to highlight our framework and to showcase which aspects of the framework we were looking at in particular for the week. So that students can sort of tune out the, the, the majority of it and, and be able to hyper focus on the specific elements. Um, again, something so simple, but you know, when we were looking at a way of talking about this uh, and we didn't really want to have a long winded paragraph explanation, um, this really hit the mark on showcasing, okay, what we wanted to do for our framework and then what we wanted to focus on. Uh, I'll just jump quickly to level three because I know we don't have too much time or week three, sorry. We called it levels last semester. Uh, and then I want to showcase the accordion in week three of dynamics. Uh, here we have some definitions of some terms of our dynamics. And again, instead of having a long winded um, sort of text based scenario, we have them now in these drop down accordion categories. 
um, simple means of content display that we think made a difference to the students as they uh, move through the space and move through the pages and were able to sort of um, spend time digesting inf information in more manageable bites. Um, and lastly would be the uh, sort of slides. Slides is another aspect of H5P in the interactive book where you can essentially, and in layman's terms, add PowerPoint slides to your slides or to your interactive book. Uh, here I use a combination of text over video to showcase flying or jumping and gliding mechanics in Spire of the Dragon. Um, but I wanted to showcase more than just one, so now I have six sets of those mechanics that I was able to very quickly showcase to the students while giving text commentary on the side. Um, you know, this can be an amalgamation of not just video, but text, uh, video, audio. Um, and you can even, I'm fairly certain, build in certain little t uh, quiz elements to it as well. So very robust in that manner. Uh, I just wanted to end with saying that the share aspect is also quite large. Again, I'm hoping that at the end of the day, we can come back uh, and finalize our materials and share it here in the catalog for everyone to view. That'll be our end goal. Um, it's really great for a portfolio piece uh, to be able to share it outside of Sakai and not be have it tied to a login specifically. And the fact that we get to share these resources uh, with other members of uh, other member institutions so that they can remix and reuse what we've done as well. Now, I haven't looked at any of the questions, but I imagine we were close to time, and I think that we will get to the questions after the fact. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, twofold, we've had a lot of people talking about um, students creating Discord um, spaces without the instructor, so I really did uh, want to highlight the fact, you know, maybe you can go there too. So I appreciate that, even though it's a tool outside of our um, our regular um, a support offering and H5P I've been using a lot so I'm happy I'm I'm now I'm happy that there's other people across the the campus who know about it it's a, one of the best things that eCampus Ontario has done so thank you for highlighting that some of the interactive elements are really fun and engaging as well so um and quite accessible so there's it's using a, uh, HTML5 so thank you for sharing that I really appreciate it and I just want we'll we can come back and, and um, have a deeper discussion but I do want to um, have <laughs> So Netta, there were, I was doing a back channel like, do you think we can restore Meta's? <laughs> You're amazing. I'm, I'm covered. I mean, I have an analog version of my Sakai page. Have you guys, have you seen the the video of that weatherman where everything breaks for him? Um, and he's just like, and they just tell him, he just like completely rolls with it. It's, oh yeah, Monica's actually the one who shared on Twitter and he just rolls with it because I was like, yeah, you know, it's always the way that the thing yeah. that you rely on and I really appreciate you okay. did all this extra work. Um, but um, okay, back. go ahead. Okay. So okay, I will so introduce, is... everybody knows Netta, I'm sure, everybody but I will knows. say that you're, everybody knows Netta, you're the Associate Dean of, of, of Humanities in addition to being an, uh, an excellent um, English professor. Um, so I'm, no, it's true. Um, I have firsthand knowledge. My daughter took your course last year. Oh, really? <laughs> so she, <laughs> we won't talk about that, but anyway. Um, uh, so. Thank you for offering to share your experiences. So, <laughs> and okay. and being so, so resilient. <laughs> no worries. No worries. This is good. This is good. Okay. So this is what my Sakai pages generally look like. So they start at the top with like a um, a picture and a title, and then over here we have a checklist. And one of the things, because this picks up on something Nadine said, one of the things I add in my checklist is how long every single item they should be spending on each item and how long every um, lecture takes. And so this is picking up on what Nadine said about workload and what I'm hearing and it's anecdotal. I haven't done amazing polling like Nadine has and I only have 40 students, so it's a bit more anecdotal. But what they like is they have a very clear idea of exactly how long everything is going to take. And it's an asynchronous course so they can they can figure out how to fit it all in um, and and they so every checklist item has like this should you should be spending this much time on this you should be spending this much time on this and this is how long this is going to take okay the next thing i do is i have my like lecture videos however many of those i produce um and i try to keep them fairly like i try to keep them under 15 minutes but sometimes they get longer because i talk a lot everybody who knows me also knows that i talk a lot but what I also find is that every now and then I break up a, 
a like me just sitting on the couch talking to them with um, I've been using whiteboard voiceovers. So I have a tablet and I have you can use universal capture for this um, or you, I use Snagit and I draw stuff on my tablet. To, it's like the equivalent of me writing on the board and those are by far like the hit of the class. Like everybody think because I'm a terrible artist and they think that's funny and like I can draw and explain things. So this is like, you know, the sort of like instructional videos, but for like, because I'm teaching theory. So it's theory concept concepts and they love that. And I think they also just love it because they're short and they are moving from thing to thing to thing. OK, next. OK, this is the next part. You can't like see this at all. So this is this section. And so what I do is I um, and this is like the it's not as cool as discord. But I'm using the comments tool, so I do use forums um, for like it's a specific assessment category. They have to do certain kind of work on forums, but I was trying to figure out a way of mimicking like them putting up their hand in class and just like that kind of back and forth response. So you can on Sakai, which I can't show you, you can like put a thing, a specific question or a specific idea, and you can just add the comments tool right into Sakai. And students can click on that and they add their little thing and you can and then and that becomes part of the lesson. And so I use this not as an assessment category, but as an interaction category and 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 what Sakai shows you is like you'll only see like six comments at a time, but you can open all of them if you want. And this is just, you know, and I always go great idea so and so. Good point. So and so and like and that's that is like the and they do it whenever and I just sort of look at it every now and then. And their in so what what I, I think what I like about it is that their interaction becomes part of the lesson, just like it would in a class if they put up my hand, put up their hand and I answered. Like it's not just something I'm marking. It's it's them participating in the teaching as well. And so I love it and and they they really respond to it well. And then it's like it becomes it's like an archive of all of their work is part of the lesson as well. OK, last. <laughs> this is like so this is what I use my hypothesis, the hypothesis tool, which I know is a pilot project. And so, OK, so I'm a literature person, so I'm a, like a huge fan of long winded text, but <laughs> but what I'm trying to do is the hypothesis tool allows students to annotate um, already existing texts. So either something that is available as a web tool, like it has a URL, or you can take something and turn it into a PDF through Google Drive and then you can they can annotate that. And so like for example, so what they're what they're using it for what I'm getting them to use it for is I'm teaching them all this like these different theoretical approaches and then I want them to kind of test them out um, before they like do their major projects. So I'm using fairy tales because fairy tales are short. Fairy tales have um, have all you can use like so you can throw so much at them and they 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 respond to it, right? So I will put up a fairy tale. I'll link to a fairy tale and then students can go in using the hypothesis tool and like highlight a particular part of the text and then a, like a comment box will pop up and they'll say I think this is a displacement for women's sexuality blah 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 or I think this is actually an example of like you know class difference uh, in Hansel and Gretel whatever like that and they just and again it's not I don't assess this stuff this is just like them working through things um, and again, on the checklist, I say this is how long it should take. And I also say it's not required. So if like this is something you don't want to do, you don't have to do it, right? But I'm finding that most of them are and they don't spend a long time on it, but it's just these little moments of interaction. Um, and yeah, and so like my big picture, the thing I learned is that even though it's an asynchronous course, um, and I was worried about that lack of kind of interpersonal stuff because so much of my pedagogy is based on my personality, I think. Um, this is, this is, you can do it, you can do it. And they can, they like clicking on things. They like interacting. What they don't like is sitting and listening for three hours. Like it's just, it doesn't, it, it is, it, it feels exhausting to them. 
So, and they like, they do their comments like at two o'clock in the morning. They do it at like eight in the morning. I don't know when they're doing it and it doesn't matter. It's like they, but they know how long they need to spend on it. They can check things off as they've done it. Um, and they get to, their participation gets embedded into the course, not just in the forums. So that's it. That's my presentation. <laughs> that's awesome. There's a lot going on there. Um, I was trying to see if I could pull up a hypothesis that has a generic to show what people look like, but it's we'll okay. just leave it at that. And we can, people it's can really talk easy. about it. It's super easy. Yeah. Yeah. And it so just to, this is another thing that uh, eCampus Ontario has provided um, the member institutions. We side, signed up with an expression of interest. Um, and so we're running a, a limited pilot this year. And we're really hoping um, with all the feedback that we get from the students and the instructors using it this term that they will uh, make it site wide and we'll be able to implement it across the university. But right now we're limited to 600 seats and we have a one class that's about 500 that's using most of that right now. So, um, but I'm happy to talk about it if anybody else and or ask Annette how you're using it specifically. Um, that's great. Uh, thank you, Netta. I appreciate you sharing. Um, and then uh, next up we have uh, one of our uh, frequent visitors to our sessions and uh, and and uh, oh, I, I think I'm going to turn the spotlight. This is a new thing. Did everybody notice how I made um, Netta a spotlight? <laughs> it's a new tool. Um, next up, we have uh, Professor uh, Raymond Chu, who um, uh, has been really uh, helpful and active with the, the Center for Pedagogical Innovation and talking about a lot of these as we make this transition. So um, and so thank you to to Raymond and you can I'll do you want do you have something to share or should I make you our spotlight speaker? Uh, I can share my slides. OK, great. OK, here we go. Uh, so Julia is definitely right that I have been gleaning quite a bit from uh, CPI of late, uh, especially since in the summer I was faced with the task of having to teach 140 international students. Uh, when most of the other instructors or many of the other instructors didn't have to teach during the summer. So the challenge and the questions with regard to this topic, engagement, uh, were quite top of mind at that time. And uh, it kind of sounds like a Hollywood, Hollywood movie and your worst fears may come true because, uh, you know, we may see engagement as following a certain set of rules or perhaps a married at first sight cold turkey kind of thing but very much uh you know it's a engagement process for the instructor him or herself to be able to discern what to do in whatever situation and so i employed a number of tools to address various problems which i'm sure many of you faced um, many of my ideas came from cpi so i have them to thank for that but um, some of the actual challenges were identified by students themselves when I did a survey at the beginning of the spring, uh, writing exams with some of them, the internet speed. So the bar corresponds to the text below it. Distractions and group projects, interestingly, was one of the highest concerns. And so uh, these were some of the concerns that I uh, broke up into eight categories. Uh, the learning curve of the online format, which is completely new, uh, getting students into the material uh, so that they can stay motivated, the reduced interaction as well as the depth, um, which people relied on the class interaction for, uh, the lack of cr critical thinking perhaps from the more virtual format and the associated quality of learning, the impersonal aspect of the technology not being known deeply, group separation and coordination, of course, is a big problem. And then other challenges that I identified was being able to continuously improve uh, the mode of delivery. And uh, there were some really good ideas that were presented earlier today, which is great. And then also enhancing the value of the online tools themselves. And so uh, just going to go quickly through uh, eight different modes of engagement is going to be a bit of a scattered thing, but we can always talk more about uh, specific ideas later. So with regard to online engagement, I knew right from the beginning that I had a challenge in ramping everyone up in terms of the technology they're using, how they're even going to get into the class, 
how they're going to join the class, how they're going to join breakouts, um, what the lecture format's going to be, how are they going to do verbal participation. Uh, because verbal participation, as you know, in the online format is very slow, um, and online classes take a lot longer, how we're going to incorporate written partic participation at the same time, and of course, uh, etiquette and privacy issues are um, important as well. So I had to lay all of this out at the beginning and also go over this at the beginning of the class in order to help people to be engaged right away. Uh, being engaged with the content is also a challenge because uh, with the proliferation of tools and the fact that we're separated uh, from the lecture hall environment, the, the print textbook becomes even more obsolete. But of course, many of us are, are very dependent on that. And so I had seriously considered and decided to, to go with the, the learning management system at Cengage um, that was integrated with the textbook so that I could annotate parts of the textbook. I could add in my own media, whether it's slides, videos, etc. I could actually lecture from the textbook so that when they go home and they're cramming for their exam or reviewing, hopefully they're reviewing, um, they are going back into the interface that they are already familiar with because I just went through it with them. And so part of that as well was having access to all their tools, which included a number of assessments, uh, self-assessments, two tests. They have uh, flashcard activities, video quiz, as well as a, um, uh, a definitional matching activity. So these were available for students as well. And I would give them two of these, two or three of them per week to get them prepared for each lecture. Um, they also have videos that allowed me to uh, tackle the most I would say the most serious challenge of business education was the fact that is the fact that undergraduate students do not have the work experience to be able to imagine the concepts that they're being taught. And so having access to those videos was also quite important. Now, in terms of interactive engagement, of course, there's many different types, but I think the particular challenge with courses is, is that because you have this chat format and all these sort of scattered modes of interaction, the collateral damage is that the depth is compromised. We really actually want to help people to engage at a deeper level, not a more superficial level. And so really making uh, Sakai forms intentional during the class, asking them to answer very difficult questions, so giving them five minutes during the class to answer questions, and, then, and basically the whole discussion uh, plan is integrated into the lecture and into the slides as well as the group work and then they have a permanent record of the things that people said and also the group work contrib contributions that people made. Uh, another area just going one step further uh, from interactive engagement is critical engagement. So being able to also engage in critical thinking and the writing associated with that in the online format. And uh, here's our very own Jeffrey Boggs from, from Geography, I believe. And uh, this in the fall term four, Brock professors piloted the Critic platform. And the main thing about that, I think the, the owners would be thrilled that I'm presenting this, but I, I'm not giving an unqualified recommendation here, but I think it's just an example of how we're struggling to provide not only more interaction in the class, but interaction between students in this format where they basically, uh, they're emphasizing not just the application and understanding uh, stages of Bloom's taxonomy, they are uh, doing evaluation analysis and creation, mainly of other people's work. And so they would do their own creation, but then they would also evaluate three, four or five other people's uh, creation and then the original creator would rate uh, the evaluations of their peers. And so it's it's kind of an iterative a reciprocal process in which there's interaction back and forth, but also higher order skills are 
are practiced and gained in the process of examining other people's work. Uh, and then the scores are given for all uh, components of that process. And so it also helped uh, to force me to make very, very structured the assessments that they were asked to do. So I, I had to break down and chunk out the various, almost at a sentence or a paragraph level, what am I looking for in this paragraph, in the second, the third, and fourth paragraph? And then the rubric corresponds to that as well. And it also facilitates the evaluators to understand what they're looking for and how they should evaluate. So it's a low stress, fairly straightforward process. Group engagement, of course, is important. Um, some of the ideas I got from CPI was to um, ensure that there is, um, you know, progressive uh, submissions. And one one main objective I really try to aim for is not to make the overall assessment dependent on any one member. And so uh, the group assessment consists of each member posting something that is a component of the whole that contributes to the whole but is not dependent on other people's work and you know getting other group members on board and coordinated is probably the biggest anxiety i think that students have in the online environment and so if they're delinquent students i have an, an alternate submission for them to make of course it is penalized but and then all of this goes into the form so that uh, students can interact with each other's uh, submissions and also, um, you know, obviously instructors can look at it as well. Personal engagement, uh, I had to tackle, I did this before the pandemic hit. I worked with Brock International Services knowing that there's 140 students coming on board uh, and also knowing that historically only half of them participate in class. Half the class doesn't say a word for the entire term, and that's a problem. And so uh, we developed, we spent a number of weeks, uh, Kelsey, Jennifer, and myself, developing this uh, workshop, which you know introduced types of thinking, you know, understanding cultural difference and how that relates to communication and also the participation process, giving tips. But we also made it very practical in the sense that we gave uh, you know, three opportunities for reflection and you know interaction and breakout groups so people could get to know the instructor, could get to know the marker graders, and very personal questions like, um, you know, looking at your childhood, what is you, something you considered fun? Uh, another one is what caused you to career choose the career you've chosen? Uh, if you could be someone important, like a superhero, hero, who would you choose to be? And, and I, the students really enjoy just being able to get comfortable with the instructor, uh, but as well they get you know practical uh, guidance as to you know how to start their participation, the verbal participation. So I would consult uh, international services for that information because I'm sharing this, um, you know, I guess. Uh, because of their their contributions, you may want to connect with them first before you use any of this material. Um, collaborative, collaborative engagement, of course, is uh, being able to improve using student feedback. So I have a get to know you survey at the beginning of the course, as well as a mid course survey to get feedback on how to improve. Uh, here's some responses showing that the usefulness of critic compared with their other courses is a lot more useful or somewhat more useful. Uh, also, the usefulness of MindTap, the LMS, is either a much better experience experience or a slightly better experience than conventional, I guess, textbook and, and slide deck lecturing. Um, and also, of course, asking what they want to get out of the course and telling me about themselves. Interestingly, I had almost 90% response. You know, people are very eager to tell, you know, to, you know, share them, you know, build a relationship with the instructor. And I also had to tackle very practical thing, things such as what time zone are you in? Uh, a very important uh, thing to know from the point of view of engagement. And then finally, in vendor engagement can take place by just getting involved, offering feedback to your vendors. So I did it for both Critic, the owner of Critic, I have a very close relationship with. 
as well as the content developer for Cengage. And as a result, I get, you know, uh, discounts for the subscriptions. I get about at least 10% free subscriptions to help people in financial need. I've actually been um, invited to come on contract with Cengage actually to provide feedback over the term. And I'm going to put that uh, back into uh, my, hopefully I can find a way to get it back into my PER so I can hire RAs. If you're skeptical about that, I already did that actually for a case award on women in management. I put the uh, whole, I guess, $1,500 into my PER, but also giving students a voice. So hopefully in the future, I will also survey them specifically about the tools and then uh, offer that, you know, of course, with full disclosure to the publisher so that they can improve the tools. So um, this is really just a scattering of ideas, but um, all the best in your own engagement endeavors. And uh, I'm looking forward to the further discussion. Thanks, Raymond. I think some of the big key takeaways there, um, whether you're using a, a commercial platform or not, is like the the setup and the preparation. A lot of that work that you did thinking about the criteria is transferable to, to whatever uh, format you're using. So I really appreciate you thinking uh, through those and sharing what, what your process was. I think as Netta said in the chat, talking about using the rubric tool, it's really that kind of what are these key questions that can get at asking what uh, for critical thinking, right? So I, I appreciate you sharing um, your uh, experiences and definitely thinking about time zones is such a, a big takeaway. I feel like that's been a really huge challenge for a lot of our students that um, we we kind of alluded to it earlier in the in the like in the spring where we're like remember people are in different time zones, but now we're really seeing it happen, and it's really interesting that like for some students are taking tests at four a.m. and so just to to even talk to them and ask them about it, I really appreciate that. I think that's a really important component of feedback, and I love that people are saying what their superheroes are. If you saw in the chat, we got Philip is the credible oh, hope. Yes. So does that? I don't know if that makes him Bruce Banner during the day, and then if he just gets angry or or how that works, and then Kelsey as Wonder Woman. So that's a really great question. That probably does get some good answers. I'm still thinking about who mine would be. Um, so like, I, I think we just wanted to kind of have a, a more open um, uh, discussion. <laughs> So there you go for our young uh, academics. If you that's a it's an interview question, so you have to be prepared. Would they did they they hired you when you said Incredible Hulk? <laughs> Sounds dangerous, actually, but anyway, <laughs> uh, it's hilarious. Um, so let's open it up and let's, uh, there was maybe some questions we didn't uh, quite get, get to dig deeper into. There were some assessment type things that we wanted to maybe know a little bit more. Um, <laughs> and so I will open it up to the floor or if you just want to put your words in chat or we can just have an open discussion. Yeah, Netta. Um, so my question is for Nicholas and Dylan. So. In terms of the, um, I think it was the HP5, H5P stuff, are, are students able to populate any of those tools, like the interactive book? I've got like, one of the things I do in my class is, um, it's called the Postmodern Exhibition. And I'm trying to figure out, like they could, they could add things in using the comments tool, because you can add visual stuff too, but I would love to, be, for them to be able to move around the stuff a little bit like more organically. So can students um, put things into that or can you arrange for that? So from the assessment pieces that we did look at, and it was limited because we really tried mm -hmm. to not go down that path because uh, it was opening up a bit of a can of worms. Um, it was more so students engaging with what we had created and mm -hmm. less so students uploading their own um, sort of creations or adding to an element and, and manipulating it in a way that didn't just reset after they hit refresh on the page. Um, and I think it's in fact in, in part due to the fact that students don't have accounts with H5P, so there's not another right. continuous sort of assessment piece that they can see the feedback or manipulate a space and have that saved. Um, it was very much, again, uh, and as an example, you could have like an image hotspot where you can put a, a diagram or a, uh, what is that word we were looking at before, Dylan? <laughs> what you created yesterday and I completely blanked on it. Uh, it was the framework. Bang. <laughs> there yeah, we go. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> framework. Uh, you can put up a framework and then you can have the students sort of, and you can highlight different different aspects of the framework and have more information pop up or have them try to describe the framework. Um, maybe even, you know, and again, or you could have 
sort of combinations of that where they send you the framework, you can upload it or you can upload right. their submissions and so then the can, other students okay, can yeah. interact with it. But that's what you're limited to. That's cool. OK, thanks. I will jump in too and say so I recently used the document tool. I don't know if uh, Nick or, or Dylan if you've used it, but it I used it for the um, uh, what's it called the uh, TA workshop. I'll just show you quickly. And basically it allows students uh, or whomever it out allows people to add what they're thinking about particular things. And then at the end it will output it as a word document. So that was really um, a kind of like it was a prompt. And so they weren't really adding or changing to the to the, the tool itself, but you can uh, use it as a way to kind of bring them through a process um, if you had a step by step if you wanted to think about it. And then the other thing that I've done in my adult ed course was because anybody with a Brock account can create um, H5P, I actually made an assignment that they go and create one. So that was really interesting because the, the, the students in my class were actually college instructors, so they were creating their own for their own discipline. So it's maybe a higher level than uh, first year, but it, it um, you could make it available for remix and then they could remix yours and add to it and add different elements. So there's a lot of possibility and then they could embed it in the forums or wherever inside of Sakai. Yeah, so ha happy to talk more about that too. There's so many possibilities. It's almost like Sorry, you know, just a gal actually. galaxy brain. <laughs> uh, student accounts can access H5P as well. Yeah. And log in. Oh, I did yeah. not know that. All you oh, need is the domain. Yeah. Anything with that? I don't, know, I don't know if okay. eCampus Ontario is aware that I'm doing that, but that's okay. <laughs> so, Thank you. Uh, Merlin, you have a question or comment? Yeah, um, thanks so much, Julia. Um, the speakers have done a great job. I, uh, I really appreciate the comments. I've taught at the undergrad level, but I've had conversations with Madeline as well around the grad level because the experience is a little bit different. Um, but I can see how many of the tools that you've talked about today would be really helpful, as well as the engagement pieces, Raymond. Um, I found your your discussion particularly helpful on that front. The the survey results shared by everyone have been super helpful too. Um, at the grad level, we're normally looking at five to ten students coming in from various time zones across Canada and, of course, internationally. We've been using um, life size and MS Teams in our courses. And on MS Teams, we found together mode to be quite effective, but um, it, it could use some maybe feedback to the uh, software developer on how we could make better use of it. The, the, so I like that, Raymond. That's a great uh, comment. The one tricky bit is at the grad level, it's tough to manage the, the questions in the chat room because you know, you're know you typically not with a TA. now. We've had some success at having other students manage the chat because what we found is students start talking one in their own lingo. Um, I don't always understand the acronym students use, but the and at times then they're slipping in personal life info into that, which gets a little complicated. I'd love to hear uh, back from Dylan um, and Nicholas around that piece of how you manage because at times there's some inappropriate content that happens to uh, get into the message board that maybe you don't want uh, in the class. And then also the last piece, and I love this because I know you guys can at least you know appreciate the grad level um, experience with our students, that at times we have um, other parties join us from the broader community. And we're tackling challenging issues and conversations around uh, climate change, for example. Um, you know, where you may or may not want the, the public to be able to add their voice, right? That you're, you welcome questions in the, in the chat room, but then, you know, you're being careful about, you know, what's making its way onto the air, if you will. Some of these are live sessions. Um, and you're also trying to protect the privacy of students that are part of, right? So that means excluding them from that live discussion. Um, so there's some tricky challenges that we face in that way. It, it, and especially as Raymond talks about the engagement piece, I'm particularly concerned about. So I just throw that out there. Maybe um, someone has some advice that way, but 
you know, Madeline and I have also talked about a follow up conversation in the CPI session around that those grad level pieces. So thank you. I, I welcome any comments around that. Thank you. Did uh, Nick or Dylan want to take anything around that kind of idea of the the comments? Like, because Discord, yeah. I've just become a little bit familiar with it. So go ahead. Sure, sure, sure. Um, and Dylan, okay, go for it. Yeah, sure, I can go to that one. Um, so thankfully, uh, on our end, it's only really happened once um, where we've even had that show up. Um, but thankfully, through the, the the tools of Discord. We have a very quick reaction. So uh, when it happened, uh, both Nick and I got notified that ding, a new thing has showed up, and that is just like all the platforms being like, okay, what showed up? You you do have to be that active uh, part participant and attachment to it of like, okay, what has shown up? Because as as you guys are right, like sometimes student posts at two a.m. and sometimes you have to be aware of what they're posting at two a.m. when you wake up at whenever, and you have to have that quick response to it. So inside of Discord, the one instance where we had to deal with that. Uh, I deleted the comment uh, and then reached out to the student individually. And we had that, you know, with that contained space where we could have the one to one communication about. Uh, so what's up? <laughs> um, the what you just communicated is not in the appropriate location. It's not in the appropriate format for what we're, we're reaching there. Um, we had no. After that, uh, there was no pushback that we experienced from that because I think we could contain the experience and still address it as like, OK, what is the issue here? And Discord gives us that ability um, very, very easily in that regard. Because we have that at, that instructor level access, we can delete anything we, we, we so like. Otherwise, um, we generally find that we are getting conversation that does have personal elements into it, but we also don't have external uh, folks coming into our Discord. It is just it contains inside of the class. Um, so they have uh, personal conversations. So inside of those discussions groups, those prompts very much always begin with like, we get here is your your prompt. Here is your like kind of meaty answer that you've taken your time to critically assess. And then in the ideal situation, we usually see it. You know, that's where the conversation starts. Where it's okay, cool. I like your point, but you know, this is the thing that I'm still interested in. This or oh wow, I hadn't thought about that, hadn't considered it. And then it brings up relevant points of well, I'm thinking of it because of this personal experience. And then by the end of the week, you end up in this segment of like, yeah, I really like cats. And it's like <laughs> it slowly goes down that way, but it's never gone to a way where it you know we're running into like these are problematic situations but discord offers us the tool to do so by paying attention to it um, if we wanted it would be perfectly possible to freeze a whole channel so no one can react and no one can see it I, we can remove access like that um if we need to but that hasn't come up yet so far Which that I think it, this all yeah. links nicely to what raymond's kind of talked about in terms of like setting it all up and you know he did a ton of work to you know set the stage of what engagement looks like in terms of privacy and how do you engage and i think that all really goes together if you're going to use those kind of boards to to make sure that happens uh sorry i think uh marilyn you were going to say something else there and i jumped in sorry no i was just going to say thank you i really appreciate that piece because at the same time you you also want the students to feel like they're engaging in some way and they're connecting with each other and they have to Absolutely. be able to, to share personal information to feel that connection. So yeah, that, that's great. Thank you. That's really Absolutely. helpful. Our pleasure. I think the last note I'll add on that is we like Nick and I are also fairly open in, in terms of how we deliver our content and how we engage in those conversations. We're also willing to have that certain level of personability as well, which often lets them be comfortable enough to open up and they can start to reinforce their conversations a lot more organically, which has worked pretty well. And just to jump in, because you know the the ed tech side and working for the faculty, it, the alarms to go off when you when you sort of move off that space in, from Brock supported spaces. Um, we do have a guide in our in our SA, it would be our assignment guide in our course syllabus and our assignment guide about proper communication etiquette um, and talking to them about those types of things. Uh, we definitely try to outline examples, scenarios, and link to outside materials to just reinforce the different ideas in which we hope that they would use the space appropriately. Um, but again, uh, you know, we're not at a point where we are not allowing them to edit their own posts or we're taking those sort of punitive or, or penalizing elements to it to, just to ensure that there is it is a safe space or extremely safe space. I mean, uh, you know, that that is a line more of a spectrum than it is a hard line as well. Absolutely. I, I might be able to add something here, especially since I teach ethics and you can imagine mm -hmm. when you're talking about ethics. It can get pretty controversial. I used to think 
that privacy would be an issue and that students wouldn't know how to engage appropriately. But I've been proven wrong. I haven't come across even one situation in you know, three years of teaching where someone said something politically incorrect. Maybe they were a little bit rude in, in the anonymous um, critic evaluations, but uh, we can put a fair bit of control around these things. We can be very, fairly specific in terms of the questions we're asking for. I also outline in my course outline, you know, how to be respectful in communication. And also we can control which conversations in in Sakai are anonymous. So some, some of them uh, I set to anonymous because I know that this particular topic could be problematic. And so I think there could be a lot of planning ahead of time just to curtail some of these uh, specific anticipated problems. I think um, I'll just add a, a little bit to that. When we do our TA workshops, we um, we talk about creating community ground rules before you even begin so that you kind of have the group generate. Like we have a list and I've shared the list, uh, which I'm happy to share again, that you could say these are the rules of engagement, but also you, if you all come together and you uh, create them together. So as one of our workshops, we had them go into breakout rooms and then we came back. Teams has this great collaborative document that people actually created. There are ways of being together so that moving forward you, you not only do you know what the rules are you help create them um, and so that has and I think that's particularly um, salient for our grad studies where we're trying to become a part of a scholarly community so it's not just um, you know like this power dynamic of instructor student it's actually no we're actually colleagues and how do we want to be in this space together so um, lots of great ideas to, to patch together um, so thank you for sharing all that um, Oh, Dylan's just answering Marissa's fun fun channel, which is a great idea too. Just as a few um, kind of bigger themes that I'm hearing coming up, if you have any other questions to ask is, I really, I heard a lot about that organizing the upfront for the students and, and setting, you know, setting out what the expectations are and, and guidance, providing that guidance. And I look at Raymond's stuff and I'm like, oh, that's a lot of stuff, but at least it's there and they can go to it and they can see it and, and they're ready for that. So I think there's organizing for our students. But then I, I'm also really, you know, I'm going to think a little bit more about this is, you know, how do we help them organize themselves? And I don't want to say it in a like, like a motherly kind of way, but more so like, how do we provide some supports in the sense of this is how you should structure your time. And I think Netta, you've done a great job in saying, you know, this is how much time you should spend on this activity. Because I've seen some forum posts where I've told them, I'm like, okay, only three or four sentences, like just high level overview. And I'm getting paragraphs because they think they're going to get better marks. I'm like, no, no, you need to think about your time. And I'm hearing this across all levels. It's not just the first year students. I have fourth year students who are still trying to figure out how it all comes together and when to do things. And so I think that's a really important thing that we all want to be thinking about is organizing for them to get there so they know what's going on in the course, but then also providing them with some supports on how to organize their, their thoughts and thinking around these courses. The other piece is that small engagement stuff. We know people love to click and they like to do little quizzes or do little things that'll keep them engaged. And so how do we do that? You know, the small clicking and, and I got to think about that as well. Um, and then the other piece around that formative feedback or the feedback to begin with. So, you know, asking a quiz up front and saying, you know, what did, what did you really like about the fall semester in terms of your async or synchronous? And, you know, we can be flexible at this time, I, I think in terms of the way that we're, we're delivering, but we also, if we're gonna ask that kind of stuff, we also have to follow up on it. So we have to be careful about that because I asked my students uh, a few or last week, just, you know, give me, the, how's it going so far? And they're like, oh, we'd love to try this or try that. I'm like, oh, now I gotta figure that out. So we got to be a little careful what you ask for, but at the same time, if you're open to change and improvement, then um, that formative feedback in the mid semester is really, really important as well. So they feel engaged in the class uh, as well. Uh, I think those were my big kind of takeaways. Uh, any other kind of questions uh, that people have? I just had a question for Nicholas and uh... Dylan, what what kind of software programs, tools? Actually, 
I have three kids who are all designers. One's in, in, in the York design program. So I'm going to get on their case to help me out and they're going to blame you for it. Um, <laughs> but what, what kind of tools would be useful to actually create the interactive elements in, um, in, in the interface that you were talking H5P or whatever? Uh, the H5P comes with a web builder or uh, again, it's H5P tools are uh, the, 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 the learning objects are all created with an in-house builder. I find that there's not too many tutorials out there at the moment. I think that's a next big push for eCampus is to ensure that there's a lot more uh, learning around the objects and the tools. But at the moment, it's very much pick up and play and test, uh, which again can can suck in a lot of hours, but you know leads to some really good uh, learning experiences because you're not sort of following a specific guide to specific things. You're finding really cool unique connections as you build and share and see and build and share and see and rinse and repeat. Um, and, and again, using the catalog, I think is very helpful. It was helpful for me when I wanted to learn any tool, I would just look to see what other people were doing. And if they had the structure that I liked, I kind of reused it to be quite honest, because mm -hmm. that's what the service is meant for. And uh, yeah, it worked out really well that way. But is your question asking like, what kind of graphic design tools can, would you recommend to buy for your children so they can make you custom graphics? But it sounds like you're saying that it's all proprietary, like it's all contained within the application. Uh, well, oh, H5P okay. is an open source tool, so it's not technically um, proprietary. But okay. um, and so you can import images um, if that's what you were trying. If you're wondering if they can help you create some custom graphics, and I think before Dylan, you said that you used Illustrator, Adobe Illustrator, and there are some yeah. other tools like that that you can import your images. And if, um, if that was part of your question, if I remember correctly, and this this might. This is like scratching the back of my, my brain here somewhere, but um, there is, if you don't go through eCampus, there is like a completely open source version of H5P that you, like it's from scratch, you're into the scripting of it at that point, um, but it's totally free to anyone to try and, and, and use and experiment. I think that's still available on H5P.org, but I might be, hey, look at that. <laughs> so H, yeah, so H5P is a tool that was actually developed by one of the Nordic countries government because they were tired of paying for these tools. And so they, they as part of like a university research lab, they said like create this open source tool and let's make it available. The problem is that the hosting was really expensive. So they were, at first it was really open, then they closed it down. And then that's where like the, the paying for the LTI component to get uh, as part of, you know, your learning management system costs a little bit of money. And then so eCampus Ontario has actually paid for like this hosting component. Um, but since then, uh, they've opened up H5P again. So I feel like there's a little bit of a reliability. Um, I don't know, like it's very portable and you can export your stuff out, but I'm not 100% sure that it will remain as a repository that we can always uh, tap into. It's probably dependent on that government <laughs> funding, which, which to be fair, I suppose eCampus Ontario still has that kind of limitation, but at least it's still very portable. Um, I do, I long term, I'm hoping that we'll have an LTI connection and it won't, and eCampus Ontario will pay for it, but we're, let's, let's build the library first. <laughs> um, Onetta has a great, uh, so maybe I'm going to have to read it. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead, Netta. <laughs> well, it's just like I had first I was going to do reading quizzes where like they were going to be timed and you have to do them before you see the lectures. And then I was like, I don't first of all, I don't know how to do this. Like, I'm, I'm sure it's going to like Sakai's broken today. What if this breaks? You know what I mean? So I just said, no, no time limit, but you can only do them once. And my students literally on the first day, they said, well, what if we cheat? And I said, well, what do you mean? They say, like, what if we have the thing open and are reading it while we're doing the quizzes? And I was like, that would be ideal. <laughs> Because that means you're reading carefully enough to answer the quiz questions correctly. And they were like, really? Yeah. And and so some things, which I swear to God, students have never read before in this class, like or only like one or two great students read them. Everybody's reading everything. And they're all getting really good marks on the reading quizzes, which are acting like a 10% bonus. And so it's been like, it's blown my mind. And yes, whoever said, I can't remember who said like some of this stuff, I think it was Linda, can be used offline. This is one I will keep using. Like reading quizzes, which I'll use Sakai for, no time limit. Like you can only do it once, which means these students are gonna read these things as deeply as And it's fantastic, it's fantastic. That's, 
Thank you for sharing that. I've been talking about that because we know um, from a lot of the psychological and cognitive research that there is a testing effect. So that actually asking somebody something and then you taking the moment to think about it has is a strong learning. So what that what you're doing is assessment for learning as opposed to um, just assessing the learning, right? So there's performance versus, you know, no, this is a learning activity. So providing that opportunity to like, these are the key things that I'm interested in. That's why I'm asking these questions. And then they're like, oh, I better read that stuff. It's like, thank you. Please read that stuff. That was the whole point of it. Awesome. Thank you, Netta, for sharing. Yeah, I, I think for uh, I, the 30 percent of my course is that kind of thing through the LMS. Uh, one question I have uh, that I'm struggling with is that, you know, the proliferation of these tools and these smaller assessments, which have been encouraged by CPI, and I, I, I agree with them, I think is really creating an environment for the students where they're, they're, they're having problems coping, like the constant weekly deadlines, these small things, and also coping with different platforms between courses. I, I really don't know what to do about it. But I don't know if anyone has any thoughts because it's actually creating a problem as well. Yeah, I'm getting that feedback too. And I would like to talk about it because we did, this is a good learning strategy that to keep people on track, that they have to have like these explicit deadlines and it's better to do these incremental things. This is like what the le literature has shown us, but also we are in a global pandemic and people are all by themselves in their homes in really stressful situations and they have five courses that are asking them to do this or maybe sometimes six and so the students are reporting back where um like we did a some formative from a, a other courses and they're reporting back that the workload is really high and it's very stressful and so even though individual courses might be doing it well i feel like overall it's having this cumulative effect so we really do need to think about it at a programmatic level of uh, so that we're not stressing people out but i'm happy I would like to open this up to other people because maybe you have solutions or just you want to share. Um, Nadine, you raised your hand, I think, and Netta. Yeah, yeah briefly, <laughs> you kind of answered it. Um, like, I just find that I am just, oh, like, I've never had more um, people asking for extensions than, you know, this year. Um, but I even, like, I've been very flexible about that and saying, yes, certainly, go ahead. Like, and, you know, even now, I'm finally getting the first part of my course closed. So I've had students, even I have a meeting with another one today about, you know, I haven't done anything. Is it too late? Right? Can I still do the work for the course? So, and I'm going to say, yeah, of course, let's try, right? So I think the reality is that we've got to be flexible. And um, but I, I, I kind of agree with this. I'm a bit worried about the number of tools that how different all our courses are looking. Um, I, that's why, in a way, I kept mine very kind of bland <laughs> with just Sakai, uh, Sakai and Teams, and that's the only thing I did. And I kind of feel like, especially in the first year, that maybe just learning those things were would be enough for the first term of the first year. And I'm really kind of glad I didn't try to do too much else because I really think that as it was, you know, the students are stressed. So um, yeah, I, I kind of feel like um, it might be really difficult for the students to really have that sense of being able to finish stuff from A to B to C to D because they don't even remember what A was anymore more by the end of the week and and I don't really know how to help them with that um, other than maybe checklists and things like that but um, yeah it's hard it's hard for all of us right and you can't remember today's Wednesday or today's whatever day of the week it is so anyway that's my two cents I know TJF oh no it's Wednesday <laughs> is every hour cocktail hour now I don't know anyway. Netta did you did you want to add to that I yeah. I have, I just wanted to say that one of the things I found when I had my, this is how long you should take this, that was all, I, that also taught me a good lesson. Like this taught me like I, ha, when I, when the list, when the hour got, was past the hour, it's like, that's it. No more. You can't ask them to do any more than that. So it, it's, it's a good, it's good pedagogy because it teaches you also if your expectations of students are unreasonable. And I also have Nadine, I have like, so checklist of this is what's on the lesson. And then I have a note to self checklist, which is just because I'm reminding them about deadlines. I'm reminding them about how long, like longer projects are going to. So I like have note to self. Yes, I have started reading this novel, which I know is going to take me three weeks to read yet. You know what I mean? Yes, I've actually started thinking about the research for this. And it's just like constant um, little like like little like pins 
just so that they're doing because they have to do as Raymond said, they're doing like a lot of these little tiny things and I try to be really cognizant that I'm not asking them to do a bajillion of those like I'm being reasonable with what I ask them. But then they have these long term things. So what I'm really worried about with extensions and I've talked about this is like extensions are great, but you're still going to have like this pile up of work when you need a break like the winter break needs to be a break. Right, so so extensions are it's great to be flexible, but I always want them to realize like what they're asking for. Right. Ver and then sometimes they say, like, you don't need an extension. This is easy. Spend half an hour on this and give me what you got. Do you know what I mean? So so it's 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 like it's just all it's complicated. But I think if we really pay attention, we can learn a lot about ourselves as teachers and about what, like what we should be asking of these students. And like a lot of the, maybe what we're asking of them is not fair. Thanks, Nana. That's a great point. Um, Dylan, did you want to add to that? Yeah, there's there's just uh, uh, two points I got on that front, and and I, I completely agree with uh, both of you guys' points. I think they're 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 right on the money. You do have that concern of that that giant pileup of extensions at the end of the day. Um, for Nick and myself, I know our course has already always been very clear on if you want an extension for any reason, you can have it. We like as long as you give us a heads up before your assignments in, that's cool have an extension. We don't need to know your circumstances if that works uh, If that works for you. But I think the bigger part that that's more important around that, and I think you made this point earlier, Netta, is breaking down the barrier between the student and the instructor is often something that we, we find really creates the dynamic between our really good students and our students who do well. Um, our really good students are willing to talk to us. Uh, they, they're, they're already comfortable with reaching out and having that conversation, even if it's very brief. And if we find more ways where you can break down that conversation, there's not a single one of our weeks, there's not a single one of our posts. It, it, it's, it's honestly to the point that I, I hope well, we're not annoying them with it. Every single one of our messages ends up with, do you have any concerns, any questions, any comments? Just uh, message us on Discord, shoot us an email. Any way you can get in contact with us, do. And every year, the students that do are usually some of our best students. I think, and that's not necessarily because you know they they are have the the brightest set coming into our course. It's because they're just willing to talk to us, and you know we're able to share those experiences. We can pass things along of like you don't have to go completely crazy on this. With of course the catch that extensions because all of the extensions or it ends up uh, all piling up at the end of the day. So. It, it, it definitely becomes tricky. Nick and I teach a relatively small course in the grand scheme of things. I think we have 30 students because we just had one add back. Um, and so that that you know that problem becomes exponential the bigger your course is. But really, I think that's where we've had our greater success is breaking down that barrier that they're willing to reach out to you because it de-stresses them that you know you're no longer the ominous figure on the other side of this uh, email chain or, or a video call. Uh, we have a couple guys who uh, routinely attend our office hours who are very comfortable talking to us. Um, you know, we're willing, to, we can have, you know, a bit of a conversation back and forth where they're like, yeah, but I don't understand this. Can you like re-explain this? Or I don't know if I agree with that. And that's great. I'd love that those are the students that are coming there. So it's hard and, and I wish I had like that clear set tool on how to do it, but really finding a way to break down that barrier so that you're very, um, your students are comfortable having that conversation, whether it's for an extension or just to say, I'm stressed, um, whether that's with your TAs, whether that's with you personally, I think that goes a very long way. That, that's all. Great, yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate everybody sharing and being quite honest about the challenges and, and some of your successes. And, um, I really think it speaks to the great stuff that's happening at Brock, so thank you so much. We're doing another one of these on, November 11th. We'd love for everybody to come back and join us. Um, we'll have a new set of people sharing um, what they're up to and how it's going. I do want to especially thank our presenters today. Thank you so much for um, especially given, uh, yeah, like I'm just watching the back channel of, of people fixing Sakai. It's uh, amazing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it will be fixed really soon. Um, and uh, and I think that the key takeaway, which Madeline talks about a lot, is like holding the gains, is that there's so much great, amazing stuff that is happening that uh, that you've all identified that really can continue to happen, even if things went back to quote unquote normal uh, when we go back face to face. There's some really excellent um, teaching. We're learning so much, and I really appreciate you taking the time to share all of your learning. So 
um, this officially wraps up this session. I'm happy to stay here and chat a little bit more if anybody else wants to, but I know that people have to get going. And so I think I'll stop the recording at this point and, and thank everybody. Um,